Well, we are now to our next speaker, Dr. Alexander Moreira Almeida. Trained in psychiatry and cognitive behavioral therapy at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil, where he also obtained his PhD in health sciences. Dr. Moreira Almeida is a published author, founder and director of the Research Center in Spirituality and Health at the School of Medicine, Federal University of Juiz de Fora. Dr. Moreira Almeida is chair of the World Psychiatric Association Section on Religion, Spirituality, and Psychiatry, and coordinator of the Section on Spirituality of the Brazilian Psychiatric Association. Please welcome Dr. Alexander Moreira Almeida. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation, for being here. It's a great pleasure for the first time being here uh, at this event. And also, thank you all for coming. Well, now I will talk a bit about the implications to clinical practice of the studies in spirituality. During the day, we had several presentations talking about uh, research on spirituality, about teaching on spirituality to clinicians, but now we'll discuss more practical things uh, related to the subject. Let me see. Okay. So we will start speaking a little bit about the importance of religion and spirituality to clinical care, uh, but the previous presentations uh, made my presentation here in this topic much easier, so I will be faster on this topic. And then discuss, uh, in terms of clinical implications, two main areas. One is the assessment, assessment of patients' spirituality. Especially, we will discuss about the spiritual history of patients and also the differential diagnosis between spirit, healthy spiritual experiences from mental disorders that can, can be similar to spiritual experience, and finally, the implications to treatment. Well, first is, uh, despite many predictions uh, from the early 20th century, when many people thought that spirituality and religion would disappear in the world. Now, more recent data from this millennium, uh, we have that most population in most countries hold some deep spiritual beliefs. For example, most of the population of the most populated countries in the world believe that people have a soul and even that there is life after death. These are usually two core ideas related to major or many uh, spiritual traditions. And we have a large prevalence of religious beliefs, of spiritual beliefs, spiritual practices. And now we, all, we also have a lot of studies showing the implications of spirituality and religion on health. These two editions of the Handbook of Religion and Health that were edited by Harold Koenig, uh, he, he performed a systematic review of more than 3,000 studies on spirituality and health. So we have now a solid research base to say that we know now that spirituality and, and religiosity actually impacts health usually in a positive way, but also in a negative way. And we will discuss this a bit now. Two ways, this is very important in clinical care. Mo many people use religion to cope with stressful situations, with disease, with life challenges and things like that. And uh, the authors usually separate the religious coping in positive religious coping and negative religious coping. The positive religious coping uh, is usually associated with better health outcomes, less depression, higher quality of life, higher resilience, and so on. On the other side, the negative religious coping are related to 
worse health outcomes. Okay, so these are some examples of positive religious coping, and I took these items from the famous uh, religious coping scale developed by Ken Pargament here from the US. So usually a patient that uses positive religious coping, he looked facing a struggle, facing a problem, a big challenge in life, they looked for a stronger connection with God. They sought God's love and care. They tried to do their best to face the problem, and the rest they trust in God, something like that. They ask forgiveness for their sins. They also try to see how God might be trying to strengthen the patient in this situation. So, of course, as you can see, uh, this scale is more uh, focused on uh, Western religions. They were developed here, but they are very useful for most uh, patients. So basically, the patients with positive religious coping, they seek help in religion. They try to put a collaborative coping with God. They do their best, but they know that they cannot control everything. So they do their best, and, they, and in the rest, they trust in, in God, in the, uh, in the universe, and things like that. And they try uh, to also to help other people, not focus only on themselves, and things like that. On the other side, the negative religious coping, usually they have feelings not that God loves them, but that God's, God is punishing them, is abandoning them. Uh, they also they have a deferral coping. They defer to God the solution of the problems. Sometimes they are very passive. They do not do what they can do to face the problems, to cope with the problems. They just defer to God, or they think that the problem was caused by the devil or some other evil force and things like that. And just to provide some few examples of studies investigating the impact of spirituality and the health and also of positive and negative religious coping. This is a paper of our research group. We investigated 168 bipolar outpatients at Federal University of Juiz de Fora. And we found, there is a pointer here? Yeah. We found, for example, regarding depression, people who had bipolar patients who had positive religious coping had four times less depression than people with low positive religious coping. Or saying the other way, people with low positive religious coping had four times more depression than people with higher um, religious coping. Also, intrinsic religiousness, people with uh, low intrinsic religiousness they had five times more depression than bipolar patients with high levels of intrinsic religiousness. Regarding quality of life, these are several dimensions of quality of life, physical, psychological, social, and environmental. We saw that positive religious coping was related with better psychological quality of life. On the other side, the negative religious coping was related with worse uh, psychological quality of life. So this is the dark side of spirituality. Another big issue in clinical care also are religious disagreement toward the treatment. So we found that about 30% of patients reported some sort of religious disagreement regarding the psychiatric treatment to bipolar disorders. Another example of a uh, relationship between spirituality and health is, 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 this is a study with 12,000 university students in Brazil from all over the country. And we found that uh, not being religious university students, non-religious university students, they had on average the double the risk of using marijuana, tobacco, and alcohol comparing to religious college students. And finally, this is a, a recent uh, American study 
uh, that was recently published. It was a follow-up of almost 90,000 US nurses from 97 to 2010. And they investigated the risk of suicidal, of, su of death by suicide in this uh, large cohort. And they found, basically, that compared uh, people who never attended, the nurses who never attended religious services, they had seven deaths per 100,000. On the other side, the nurses who attended once, at least more than once a week or once a week, had seven times less deaths by suicide during this 14 years follow-up. So this is, these are some examples. You got depression, bipolar, substance abuse, and suicide, how spirituality can impact in positive and in negative ways health outcomes. So this relevance of the spirituality to patients, and there is also another important aspect that Giancarlo Lucchetti presented previously. People are now usually aware that spirituality is something important to many patients. Clinicians often recognize this importance, but very often they do not assess spirituality in the clinical care. So there is a gap between the, the awareness of the importance of the subject and the actual clinical care. Based on this gap, and all in, in also in all the data that we had presented previously, several medical associations and also health, other health associations included spirituality in their uh, evaluations. For example, the American College of Physicians, American Medical Association, the World Health Organization now recognizes that spirituality is part of the quality of life. If the Joint Commission that provides accreditation to healthcare organizations also requires uh, that spirituality should be assessed in, among patients. And also several psychiatric associations around the world, like in UK, US, Brazil, uh, and the American Psychological Association, the World Psychiatric Association, they have sections dedicated to um, spirituality and health and mental health. I had already talked about this, so there are constant findings of high levels of importance recognized by patient clinicians and medical educators. However, it's not translated in clinical care still. Based on these needs, uh, the World Psychiatric Association published this year a position statement on spirituality and religion in psychiatry. The idea, the basic idea of this position statement is to, was to alert to, uh, to alert to psychiatrists around the world the importance of spirituality. Spirituality should be taken into account in training, in clinical care, and also in research. The idea is exactly to influence the psychiatric practice around the globe. So it's recognized that spirituality and religion, this, these are parts of the position statement that is freely available. This is the website of the WPA section in spirituality, religionpsychiatry.org. Here you can freely download this position statement that was published at the journal World Psychiatry. So the relevance of religious spirituality to the origins, understanding, and treatment of psychiatric disorders also influences the patient's attitude toward the illnesses and should, there, should be central to clinical and psych academic psychiatry. So now several recommendations are made. I will stress some of them. So the patient's religious beliefs and practices and their spirituality should rotundly be considered in history taking. Not necessarily we need to take a spiritual history of patients, but uh, we need to consider the importance of taking a religious history of our patients. Another point 
is that also uh, that is, it's important to understand the relationship of spirituality to the diagnosis, etiology, and treatment of psychiatric disorders, both in training and me continuing medical education. There is a need for more research. This is a very important aspect. We know enough that spirituality and, spir and religion is related to health. But there are some major gaps in our knowledge. One of these is the mechanisms, are the mechanisms. Which are the mechanisms by which spirituality influences health outcomes? We have several hypotheses, but we do not know well exactly how it happens. The second major uh, challenge is how to translate to practice in clinical care. We will present some guidelines and some evidence now, but we need to improve mo much more on this. We have much less uh, evidence uh, regarding to how to implement in clinical practice than for the evidence of the relationship between spirituality and health. And also, uh, this is another essential aspect of spirituality, is that the approach to spirituality in clinical care needs to be person-centered. Many clinicians are afraid of assessing spirituality, first because they were not trained on this, so they do not know how to do. The second major concern, and it's a reasonable concern, to be afraid of imposing their own views over patients. That this is essential. The point is not if the clinician is religious or not. That's not the point. The point is not to make the patients religious or spiritual. This is not the point. The point is we need to be aware of patients' needs. What matters for the patient? This is what matters to us. So the approach needs to be patient-centered. So we need to explore the patient's spirituality, patient religiosity, and not impose our own spiritual or anti-spiritual belief. This is also very important. Because at the same sense that it's bad to impose some religious belief on patients, it's also very bad when clinicians using their positions to impose also or to discredit religious views of patients or to impose their anti-spiritual interpretations of experience and things like that, okay? So this is a key word, patient-centered approach. So, some guide, general guidelines, patient-centered, not prescribing, not imposing. And again, it's, it's we, um, several decades ago, for example, talking about sex was a taboo, even in clinical care. We were uncomfortable, uneasy in talking about patient sexuality. But nowadays we know that sexuality is very important, we need to know uh, the sexuality of a patient because it has implications to their health. So now we are trained to approach the sexuality of patients. But nowadays it seems sometimes the major taboo is not sexuality in clinical care, it's sometimes the spirituality. People feel uneasy in asking about spirituality with patients, feel uneasy in talking to other clinicians, to our peers about spirituality. So sometimes the, the modern taboo in academic environment sometimes is, is spirituality. And, but, but to be interested in patients' spirituality, I don't, I, as a clinician, I do not need to be spiritual myself. That's the point. Taking a spiritual history should be done by spiritual or non-spiritual clinicians because what matters is what matters to patients. So we need to be aware of the several aspects of human beings, the physical, the mental, and the spiritual needs. Another important aspect in clinical implications of spirituality is that clinicians should explore his or her 
own worldview and history on religion and spirituality. Because we know that counter-transference can have a lot of influence. Our own bias regarding religions in favor or contrary to religion could impact sometimes the need in trying to, to explore the spirituality of a patient that spirituality doesn't matter to them. But we insist, for example, in our uh, meetings with patients regarding spirituality, even if it's not important to them. Or on the other side, when patients start to talk about their deep spiritual experiences, we as clinicians feel uneasy, uncomfortable, or dismissive. So we need also to be aware about our own views, about our own bias. The major aspect is that we need to be open-minded. So we need to perform an open-minded approach with genuine interest and respect by patients' beliefs, values, and experiences. Of course, this is essential to any clinical practice, and also it applies here. So we need to really be, uh, have, be interested in patients', patients lives, beliefs, and what matters to them. So, and most of these, uh, these guidelines, if someone is interested, at this paper uh, that we published two years ago with Giancarlo Catch and Professor Harold Koenig, providing a general overview of clinical implications of spiritual disease, an open access paper in English available. Okay, so regarding assessment in clinical care, the most agreed application of religion and spirituality in clinical care is taking a spiritual history. It's very easy, and taking a spiritual history, we need to explore the importance and practical implications of religion and spirituality in patient lives, and how they apply this spirituality to their illnesses, to their stressful situations, and things like that. We still do not have many studies about the use of, uh, the impact of the use of spiritual history, of taking spiritual history of patients. However, we have some very interesting evidence. One of them is this, oh, I'm sorry. One of them was published a few years ago at Journal of General Internal Medicine. They investigated more than 3,000 internal medicine inpatients here in the US. 41% of these patients would like to have some discussion about religion and spirituality. However, only half of this 40% had actually this kind of exploration. However, however, patients who had discussions on their own spirituality were much more likely to rate the quality of their healthcare at the highest level. So the, this is one, but there are other studies showing that patients uh, value better or feel better understood uh, by their clinicians when the clinicians explored their spirituality. Probably because also patients felt that the clinicians is interested in, in, the, in themselves, in them as a whole, and not only as an organ or a symptom or something like that and showing that we are open to all these other aspects, the dimensions of patients' lives. And how can we take the spiritual history? Uh, Giancarlo Ketch and Alessandra, they published a review paper investigating the instruments to take spiritual history, and they scored the major uh, uh, questionnaires, instruments to take spiritual history. And the, the, two, the best two were the FICA. I will explain a bit more here. They take only four to five minutes in clinical consultation. And if someone is interested in performing a deeper investigation, there is the Royal College of Psychiatrists interview on spirituality that takes about 50, 20, 25 minutes. Regarding the FICA, the FICA is very easy to remember because the F 
is for faith and belief. So the idea is, during when you are taking a social history of the patient, for example, you could ask if they consider themselves spiritual or religious. And like Giancarlo said previously, if they say, no, I'm not religious, I'm not spiritual, you, you can ask, and what does meaning to your life? What matters to you? And also, you could ask if you have spiritual beliefs that help you to cope with stress. So you are assessing the, nive the level of faith of belief. Regarding the eye, is the importance. Okay, they can have faith, faith, but the faith cannot, may not be important to them. So we need to be to know about the importance and what is the importance of your faith, your belief, of your spirituality to your to yourself to cope with this problem that you are dealing now. The C is community. Are you part of a religious or spiritual community? Sometimes people can be deeply spiritual, but they are not part of a faith community. They, call, they are usually called a spiritual, but not religious. And is this, and how is your, your relationship with this faith community? Is this faith community supportive to you or no? Like we saw in bipolar patients, is your faith community against your treatment? Against that you use mood stabilizer, for example, for your bipolar disorder? Or on the opposite, are, they are bringing you to the, uh, to the consultation to see your doctor here. So we have very different aspects on this. And also the A is how you do like that we address your spirituality during your care. So if they would like to discuss more, they would like to, to, to see a chaplain, they would like to have on the other sorts of support, of spiritual support. So the FICA is very easy, four to five minutes, F of faith, I importance, C community, and A address in care. So this is one way to address, to assess the spir patient's uh, spirituality, take a spiritual history. It's important, just to another aspect, in very important clinical care. First, uh, the patient's spirituality usually changes throughout their lives. So the spiritual history also may mean the change that in patient spirituality throughout their life, the cries of faith, the increasing and decreasing on their own spirituality, is, it can have um, very important implications. For example, if they suffered abuse from a priest in their childhood, or the opposite, that the, the religious community was essential in their upbringing, in making them what they are now. So we need to understand this. The second also very important aspect is that we should not jump to conclusions based only on religious affiliation. If a patient says, I'm Catholic, I'm Protestant, I'm Buddhist, whatever, uh, it's important to know that, of course, but the same label may have many different and sometimes opposite meanings in patient's life. So in, a, in addition to ask about their own affiliation, okay, tell me more about that. You, are you Catholic? Okay, tell me more about that. Um, how do you relate to, the, to Catholicism? Do you attend or not? What are your beliefs and things like that? Just to give an example, in Brazil, a national show, survey showed that half of Brazilian Catholics believe in the reincarnation. Just to, to give you an uh, idea that we cannot trust only in the labels, okay? <laughs> okay, and there is a joke, there is a joke of uh, a, very, a very famous Brazilian, uh, how can I say, uh, the person who present, uh, a presenter, a TV presenter in Brazil, Ana Maria Braga, uh, she said that she is so Catholic and so Catholic that the next reincarnation, he would like to be a nun. <laughs> so just to, <laughs> that is, 
This is Brazilian culture, but also it happens in different uh, countries. There's this miscegenation, there's this mix of religious traditions in people's life. Okay, now moving to another aspect. We discussed about the assessment in taking spiritual history. Now we'll discuss uh, briefly about uh, differential diagnosis between spirit, healthy spiritual experiences from symptoms of mental disorders that could resemble uh, spiritual experiences. We will start with uh, some new area of investigation, that is the investigation of psychotic experience in general population. In the last one or two decades, we are more and more and more aware that not only psychotic patients, like schizophrenic patients, have psychotic experience or hallucinations, for example, seeing things, hearing things that other people cannot see, cannot hear, having hallucinations, for example. We, for example, this is the largest study ever done in this subject, a World Health Organization study with 250,000 people around the globe in 52 countries. They found that the prevalence of, oh, I'm sorry, the prevalence of psychotic experience the previous year was 12%, excluding hallucinations because of substance use and hallucinations when people are falling asleep or the when we are waking up and then we can have some hallucinations. Excluding this kind of hallucinations, 12% of the, of the world population had some psychotic experience the previous year. The prevalence of schizophrenia is 1%. So 90% of people are having, that, that have um, uh, this kind of psychotic experience act, do not have the, uh, the, the most important uh, psychotic disorder that is schizophrenia. And there is, a, uh, uh, so actually only when only 10% of this 12%, that means 1%, had actually schizophrenia. So this study showed that 90% of people having psychotic experience actually did not have a psychotic disorder. Okay? But there is also a huge variation across countries in the prevalence of psychotic experience. It ranged from 1% in Vietnam to 46% in Nepal. In Brazil, it was 30%. And so and there was also a moderate correlation with poor health, a moderate correlation that the highest, the higher the prevalence of psychotic experience, the worse the health. So some people had defended the idea that there is a continuum, a psychotic continuum in general population, People, uh, healthier people would have less psychotic experience and people more sicker people would have more um, psychotic experiences. And if, even this word psychotic experience is not a good word because psychotic has a pathological connotation. Sometimes people use anomalous experience, uh, non-usual experience, but even the word non-usual is not correct because it's not non-usual. More than 10% of people had this experience at least uh, in, the, uh, in the last year. So, and that, so we are investigating in psychiatry and psychology more and more this prevalence of psychotic experience in general population, non-clinical population, trying to understand uh, this population. And we also have found that we also have perhaps these people have psychotic experience in general population, hallucinatory experience in general population, they may be, they probably are a very heterogeneous group. We can actually have people with subtle form of psychotic disorders, milder form of psychotic disorders. However, we also can have people with high levels of psychotic experience, but are actually very healthy. This is exactly what we performed. This is a study with 115 spiritist mediums in Brazil. 
So spiritist mediums had high levels, have high levels of psychotic experience. They have hallucinations, they see things, they hear things, they also feeling uh, thought insertions, feel insertions that are usually considered very characteristic of schizophrenia, for example. And what we found was that among these 115 mediums in Brazil, they had a low prevalence of common mental disorders as investigated by the SRQ, a questionnaire developed by the World Health Organization to screen general population for common mental disorders like depression, anxiety, and so, uh, psychosomatic diseases. And what was interesting, there was a negative correlation with the, the frequency of med full trance, medumistic full trance or incorporation. So because if there was, uh, if the point was only a continuum, so the higher the frequency of psychotic experience, the worse the health, we would expect the inverse here. The higher the frequency of full trance and with all the hallucinations involved, we would expect a worse mental health. But here was the opposite. The higher the frequency, the better uh, the, the health. And also, we investigated mental health in another way. We investigated through social adjustment. The social adjustment scale uh, has been able in other studies to discriminate mental, mental uh, patients with mental disorders with health population. And even to discriminate between treated depression patients for untreated depression patients. So it's a way, not based on symptoms, but in social adjustment to, to discriminate between people that are healthy than unhealthy. And here, uh, and according to this is, is scale, the higher than they score, the worse the social adjustment, okay? And there was an inverse correlation with full trance and auditory hallucination. That means that the higher the frequency of auditory hallucination, the higher the frequency of full trance, the better the social adjustment. So it shows, as I said previously, that there is a big heterogeneity in this non-clinical population having psychotic experience. Because here we had people with high levels of this experience, spiritual experience, and they had actually better mental health. And there are uh, some other studies. This previous study was performed with people that have been mediums for many years. They have been involved actively in spiritist centers in trying to understand and to manage and to use well their experiences. On the opposite, here in this other study, we investigated 115 people having anomalous experience who seek the help in spiritist centers. So we are, they were disturbed by these experiences and seek the help in spiritist centers and they were considered by the spiritists as being mediums. And these people, they had high levels of very different kinds of experience like uh, spirit, they hear, they have a hearing, uh, visual experience, out of body experience, precognitions, several different uh, perceptions uh, they had, but they had much higher levels of mental disorders, especially anxiety and depressive disorders. They were very anxious about their experiences. And so these people were much more disturbed by their experience, and they were actually seeking help because they were disturbed by their experiences. And then we performed a, a one year follow up of these people. So we interviewed them as soon as they arrived, they spirit center seeking help. And then we did a one year follow up of these people. And we tried to detect which personality factors would predict better quality of life one year later. And what was very interesting was that 
cognitive disorganization, anhedonia, were predict and harm avoidance were predictors of worse quality of life one year later. However, self-directedness was related to better quality of life later. There are several studies now showing that people having this kind of anomalous experience or transcendental experience, if they do not have good self-directedness, good ego strength, they are often in trouble. So this is, there, this is a new uh, research area. Uh, some authors, Robert Cloninger, who is uh, the creator of the, the, the scale of personality that we used here, he is also investigating this, he's part of this study. And we, uh, we have found this, just have the self-transcendence uh, factor, anomalous experience, but with no good self-directedness, can be a source of distress to people. And also, we have performed some neuroimaging studies trying to understand the brain functioning during these trans experiences. This is, for example, a study that we performed in partnership with Andrew Newberg at the University of Pennsylvania. And we uh, investigated the brain activation during medumisk trans when they provide automatic writing compared with brain activation in regular state of consciousness when they are just providing writing a text in a normal state of consciousness. What we found basically was that from the most experienced mediums, they were able to produce a more complex text during trans writing with less brain activation in several areas related to cognitive processing. So, uh, several authors, and we have here uh, summarized some guidelines that help us to assess the clinical significance of anomalous experience. So, all these guidelines, uh, they are helpful tools to our clinical reasoning. Of course, we can find counterexample. Oh, I'm sorry. We, we can find we can find here uh, counterexamples to any of these criteria, but all these criteria they are suggestive of a non-pathological experience. Sometimes a health spiritual experience. For example, when the experience is not causing psychological suffering or impairment. The experience usually has a short duration. It's not invasive. They have the capacity to perceive the unusual, anomalous character of this experience. Kind of, they have some insight about this experience. This experience is comfortable with some religious tradition or established spiritual tradition, even if it's not the spiritual tradition of the patient himself or herself. But this kind of experience has been described and even fostered by some spiritual tradition. There is absence of psychiatric comorbidities. This is essential. We have emphasized less and less in the diagnosis of psychotic disorders. We have emphasized less and less the perceptual anomalies, the hallucinations. We have stressed much more the cognitive disorganization we have emphasized the anhedonia. We have emphasized the other negative symptoms, disorganization symptoms, and not emphasized too much the positive symptoms, the hallucinations. So usually, in the people with mental disorder, they have other symptoms of depression, of uh, negative symptoms, disorganization, and so on and so forth. And also, if the experience provides personal growth throughout time. One important aspect that we know nowadays also is to have a cognitive framework to make sense of this experience. If people start having anomalous experience or spiritual experience, and they do not have a cognitive framework to make sense of this experience, they may be very afraid of this experience. For example, near-death experience. 
This person have, have a near-death experience, and they believe they are becoming crazy, they, they are lo losing their minds. This, this can be very, it can generate a lot of anxiety, fear, and suffering. But if they have some cognitive framework to make sense of this, very often some spiritual uh, framework to make sense of this, it may be the difference between causing suffering or not. Okay, and finally, moving to the last part of my presentation about the implications for treatment. Here is a recent meta-analysis uh, published by a, a group of Brazilian researchers investigating the spiritual intervention in mental health. One, for example, one ma the major result of this uh, systematic review was that for anxiety symptoms, the use of spiritual interventions like meditation, like uh, cognitive behavioral therapy had modified to spirituality had impact on in decreasing levels of anxiety. In terms of clinical care, practice, interventions, one way to use spirituality in clinical care, in treatment, is to, provide, is to perform a collaborative approach exploring patients' useful spiritual resources. For example, in the past, which kinds of spiritual practices have been useful to you? Perhaps they can be useful now, again. For example, reading religious texts, when they are anxious, when they are disturbed, sometimes reading religious texts of their own traditions can be very comforting in helping them to find some guidance. The religious cognitive framework to deal with problems. For example, a patient that is feeling very guilty for uh, some misbehavior or something that they had committed, some thing and they feel abandoned by God, for example. If they are Christian, is a, if, it is, if he is a, or she is a Christian patient, we could discuss with them some passages of the gospel, for example, about the adulterous women, how Jesus accepted her in unconditional love. We could talk to, uh, to the patient, for example, about the prodigal son. And some other examples of unconditional acceptance of the sinner, for example. This can be much more uh, significant to the patient than if we discuss only in secular basis. Of course, it depends on patient's background. I need to respect the patient's background. Some religious rituals, praying, we have some patients, several patients, crack addicted patients in Brazil saying that when I'm a craving, terrible craving uh, of crack, I start to pray. And prayer is better than diazepam for me. They say exactly this, okay, sometimes. So listening to or watching religious spiritual programs, prayer meditation, community service, attending religious services, seeking spiritual healing in their community, and attending religious service and practicing some religious practices or, uh, or voluntary work or things like that can be part of behavioral activation in depressive patients, for example. Usually very useful. We can refer to religious spiritual resources and community. For example, there are, uh, for example, in Brazil, several religious groups that support people with suicidal ideation, people who had try the suicide, suicide attempt, or suicide addition, they provide some support for grief and things like that. The use of spiritually modified psychotherapies, this is well established nowadays. There are several studies and meta-analysis showing, for example, that cognitive behavioral therapy modified to include spiritual aspects is at least as effective as regular CBT. And another example, in case of conflicts with religious community or religious view of patients, like as we discussed previously with bipolar patients, sometimes we can, for example, ask the patient if we could contact their religious leader 
and try to make a collaborative effort to help, to help patients. Usually this is very useful. Also, we could emphasize universal values of all faiths, just kindness, love, indulgence, forgiveness. This is also, and also may be useful if patient is just having contact of, with some very restrict uh, brand, branch of their own tradition, perhaps helping them to find other approaches in their own religious traditions that are more, uh, that foster more acceptance, forgiveness, and things like that. And also the, the faith-based organizations can be also very helpful to public health. This is also a paper that we had published with some colleagues showing that 20% of patients in the United States cons uh, with mental health problems first seek religious advisors. In Africa, 30 to 70% of all health infrastructure is based by faith-based organizations. Okay? In Brazil, we had the children's pastoral care with more than 200,000 volunteers that were essential in poor communities in decreased childhood mortality. We also have in Brazil, uh, one third of the not-for-profit hospitals in Brazil are run by religious organizations. And there are many psychiatric, spiritist psychiatric hospitals. Our time is closing to the end. Let me just skip some stuff here. So, in conclusion, take home message. Religion and spirituality is important to many, if not to most patients. Religion and spirituality to be, needs to be respectfully assessed and may be integrated in treatment according to the patient's acceptance and patient's needs. Some of the major challenges that we face now, training and education, as Giancarlo presented previously, how to implement uh, the assessment and, and the integrating treatment spirituality, and also to do more research in both areas, specifically in training and also in implementation and also in mechanisms of the impact of spirituality in health. In trying to foster the education in spirituality, our research group develop a YouTube channel, bilingual, in Portuguese and in English. In every week, there is a new video, bilingual video, exactly talking about uh, spirituality in clinical care, spirituality and depression, spirit how to take a spiritual history, how to make different diagnoses, how to integrate in treatment, and things like that. Okay? And this is my email contact, the website of our research group, and our YouTube channel. Thank you very much. Uh, now comes the, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Marera Ameda. Uh, and now comes the fun part where we ask the audience to engage. Uh, we uh, invite Dr. Dare to join his colleague uh, up on center stage. And again, there is a microphone uh, back of the center aisle. Uh, please. Uh, do not be afraid of uh, those questions burning in your minds. Uh, any comments on anything that they have discussed or anything related, please come forward and ask your questions. I guess I'll start again. <laughs> Dr. Moreira, thank you very much for both of you. Phenomenal work on both. Question for you, uh, is there a detriment to assess religiosity on patients that have negative coping? Meaning, asking them the religious question if they cope negatively with that. What was the beginning of is, your question? Is there a detriment to them? I mean, if you is bring this, up is, religious, uh, religious... It's harmful, it, if it's it, harmful. It's harmful to them, correct. Uh, this is a, a very important issue. No, we, we need to assess the spirituality, specifically also to see if the patient is 
using negative religious coping strategies, okay? Because there are several studies, not only, as I, saw, I, sh I showed previously, showing that uh, negative religious coping is related to more depression, better and worse quality of life. There are some studies, studies showing that it's higher mortality in, in general medical inpatients uh, with negative religious coping. So, yes, first we need to assess the to, to assess if they are using negative religious coping. So if they are doing this, uh, first uh, we need to know uh, that uh, many patients, they use sometimes negative religious coping, but not permanently. They use during some specific problems and then they can solve this and turn to a positive religious coping, okay? So uh, in knowing this first, we could help patients to foster them, to foster the use of more positive religious coping. And also if it is uh, sometimes more complex religious issues, we could refer patients to chaplains or to other religious leaders to help them to improve their coping in a more positive way. But there, are, but there is a need of more studies in how to deal clinically with negative religious coping. Thank you for your attention. Dr. Moreira, <laughs> um, my sister who has spent a great deal of time in Brazil and has also participated actively in the Santa Daime Church reported to me that there's a very different approach in Brazil to schizophrenia where they uh, perceive some of these other spirits to be, um, they, they give more respect to them uh, in contrast to the U.S., which will give a quick prescription for Zyprexa. And uh, I don't know if this is true or not, so being that you're a psychiatrist, I, I'd like to hear. Okay. Well, uh, so first I'd like to make clear that when I present that data about uh, psychotic experience in general population, mm -hmm. I'm not denying the existence of schizophrenia, okay? I, I'm basically saying that uh, most patients, mo most people having this kind of experience do not have schizophrenia, okay? Mm. So this is uh, one important aspect. Uh, because the addressing the patient's spirituality, it does not mean that we would think that all sorts of anomalous experience are healthy and not necessarily pathological. On the opposite, we are exactly trying to to help, because I think in dealing with spirituality in clinical care, sometimes we have the risk of the two extreme poles. Extreme poles. One extreme pole is to deny uh, the spirituality and to deny that this kind of anomalous experience can be healthy. On the other extreme is denying mental disorder, denying that the that is schizophrenia, and everything is a healthy spiritual experience. So I think we need to avoid both extremes, okay? Regarding specifically to Brazil, the Santo Daime, they, uh, they do not give the ayahuasca to schizophrenic patients. They have a screening, especially mm. Union do Vegetal, also another church related to ayahuasca. They usually, they do, they, the more traditional daime and Union do Vegetal, they usually, they do not, they have a kind of a screen, screening, and they do not uh, give ayahuasca, the tea, to psychotic people, okay? They can involve their, their rituals, but they, not, they do not give the, 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 the tea, okay? Mm -hmm. And also, uh, what we see uh, in Brazil, uh, not that uh, uh, the culture would accept the the schizophrenia as a spiritual experience. Sometimes it happens, but more often uh, the idea is to work together. Uh, they can go to, to psychiatrists to receive the antipsychotics, but also at the same time receive uh, spiritual support for, to help them in their integration and restoration in society. Mm -hmm. So just uh, to let you know, what she felt was that the treatment of schizophrenia in Brazil was superior to that in the United States, which is heavily involved with dosing patients. And you're also talking about divisions of, you know, is this person really schizophrenic versus are they having 
some yeah. anomalous experiences, and I, I, I want to really respect that because just handing out pills, which frequently happens in the U.S., creates dismay for me. Yeah. No, actually, I think that that's the point. Uh, it's not good psychiatry, even for um, standard psychiatry. It's not a good psychiatry to, to, for a schizophrenic patient just giving pills and, and period. It's mm -hmm. not the, a good psychiatry. Mm -hmm. Good psychiatry, even, even the conventional psychiatry, would recognize that we need to have a much more interdisciplinary approach mm -hmm. to, to schizophrenic patients. Thank okay, you. thank you. For both presenters, thank you for sharing your experience. But my question is for Dr. Georgi Daher. Uh, in the papers you reviewed, uh, any pa do any paper uh, talks against the, the phenomenon, for example, talking against the near-death uh, experience or uh, um, out of body experience, uh, uh, you find this paper with the, this key word, and the paper is talking against the phenomenon, uh, denying the phenomenon. Uh, was there some papers in the sense, or all the papers you reviewed uh, uh, were for the phenomenon or exploring the existence of the phenomenon? Hi, Marcelo. Uh, nice question. Uh, especially in near-death experiences, there are a lot of papers uh, talking against the, the experiences and uh, consciousness experience beyond the brain. There are uh, a number of papers that postulate the, the brain uh, uh, source of the experience. Well, we, as uh, those papers uh, created a uh, hypothesis denying our, uh, our hypothesis that uh, it's a, a consciousness phenomenon, we included in the, in the uh, research because they, uh, they could approach the theme, the theme, sorry. Uh, they approached the subject that we were uh, we were studying. In out of body experience, uh, it uh, out of body experience uh, was the hardest area because uh, the meaning of out of body of, of body experiences uh, we can have uh, neurological uh, disturbance. We can have uh, psychiatric uh, uh, disorders that can cause uh, experiences, uh, not uh, uh, true experiences. Then in this area, we had uh, a lot of papers uh, that, uh, uh, that, uh, that was uh, more to brain or cerebral uh, origin of the experiences. Then in those that uh, postulate or uh, deny the consciousness uh, source of the, ex the experience, we included. Those that, uh, in the case of, of out of body experience, that uh, was concerned about epilepsy or about uh, psychiatric disorders, we refused it. We consider errors out of our uh, uh, the purpose of the the research. Yeah. So when you say the production of scientific papers is increasing, we can understand that is increasing the the grounds to accept this phenomenon. No, the the papers that deny this phenomenon or say this is a mambo jumbo or there yeah. is materialistic uh, explanations for the, the, the phenomenon. We can understand that is, uh, the growing body of evidence is to um, defend the phenomenon. Because the great number of papers, we, 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 we cannot, uh, well, I, I, we do not perform uh, division of papers who accept, papers who denied. For each area, maybe it's uh, another uh, uh, another ground of the the research. We can uh, uh, maybe uh, separate 
papers who deny it's a it's a project. The papers that the the consciousness consciousness beyond brain can be uh, implicated or can be the the, the outcome. Uh, it's the the second part of the project uh, to have uh, those papers in each areas. But uh, because the great number of papers, we can see the the growing or the, or the the rapidly increase of the publications of both the the, the papers uh, who denies and the papers uh, where the hypothesis of the survival of consciousness or the possibility of the consciousness beyond the brain uh, are the, the outcome that was analyzed. Thank you. Question for Dr. Dai. Uh, you mentioned that uh, a higher number of papers uh, published in spirituality and all the other topics that you mentioned were in the United States. So the United States seem to be the leader in these publications. But my question is, were these publications originated from groups in US, in America, or were um, papers that were originated in other countries and published in American journals? Well, no, we, we had, uh, uh, when we analyzed the, the papers, we look for the affiliation, affiliation of the main author, the first author. Affiliation was uh, the origin of the country. Then uh, Michael Nam, for example, he's a German. He was living in America. Then the, the papers that uh, were published when he was here in America, we counted as American production. Our session for today, uh, the Congress will continue tomorrow morning at 8.15. We, on behalf of the U.S. and International Spiritist Medical Associations, we give our appreciation to all of you for your attendance, for your participation, your questions, and to all of the speakers. You have, uh, in my feeling, is you have enriched us with your knowledge and give us as much to think about. Uh, and as you folks leave today, be certain to look underneath your seats uh, for any items. Make certain to return those. Also, uh, if you're coming back tomorrow, hold on to your name tags, bring them with you. If not, you can drop them off uh, outside. And if you have any translation devices, please return them to the back table and pick up your photo IDs. We wish you a safe drive back to your residences and a very good evening. And see you tomorrow, hopefully. Thank you.